All right, good morning and welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. Uh, today we'll be covering the July recaps of all the uh, releases and everything that were processed uh, in the month of July. And I will go ahead and start with the payroll first. And then I believe Pat will be doing the USAS side of it after I'm finished. Um, I will apologize right up front. If you hear noises in the background, I have some construction going on right now. And uh, today, of course, is the day that they're the loudest. So um, I apologize. I'll try to talk loud enough so you can hear me. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, in July, we had three regular releases and one hotfix release. So our first release was the 669. And on that release, um, we had some bug fixes. Uh, the first one was um, for the attendance mass add option. It will now allow you to enter the same start and stop dates when creating an, uh, a record, an attendance record or an absence record. So let me just go out and kind of briefly show you that really quickly. Go here, attendance. Oops, of course I clicked on adjustments, didn't want to do that. Okay, so I can go in here and do the mass add option. I had to look and see where I was at here. I'm just gonna go in and add this employee. And let's just say I wanna add an attendance day. No, let's do an absence day. So if I went in here and did 8-1 through 8-1, I can now go in and click the create button and it will create that record. Before, it wasn't allowing you to enter the start and stop date of being the same. So now that is a possibility that could be done. So you can see now that record has been created. <clears throat> um, the next bug fix that we made, um, on the benefit obligation reports, both the employee and the account report, those will now exclude archived compensation data. Before they were including it and it should not have been. So they basically did that to exclude both uh, or exclude those uh, archive records. Um, also, another thing is the unit amount from the new compensation should be used as the rate on the report to calculate for the amounts of sick vacation and personal leave. It wasn't before, um, now it will be, it will actually be using the new compensation, not an archive compensation record that was already like their original record to begin with. So now the correct record will be used when processing the report. Uh, the next fix was EMIS reporting. Um, the attendance and absence counting will now exclude position compensations that are archived or sent to uh, no to report to EMIS. And you'll find further down the line here, we actually kind of said that we reverted it because it was causing problems. So that was changed on the bug fix. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another thing that we fixed uh, was the employee number generator. Um, when the employee number generator initially was being used, it was checking for specifically nine characters when trying to build the new uh, employee numbers. Uh, so a lot of districts don't use nine characters. So what we did is we updated the, the generator to only take the number that is available from like the employee count number. So now if that number is, you know, seven characters, it will create it using just the seven characters. It will not be looking for the nine characters that it previous, previously was. Um, the employee onboarding, uh, it, was it was validating when you were creating the, the uh, pay accounts um, and it was looking at all active percentage accounts or no, what, excuse me, let me go back. It is now looking for all active percentage accounts. Um, before it, it was not looking for all per percentage accounts. So what it was doing is they could have had two records set at 100%. It was accepting that, it wasn't throwing an error. It wasn't validating. So now 
um, it will not allow you to save. It will not allow you to save when you're creating pay accounts uh, uh, records as far as like two 100% accounts. It will not allow it. You'll get an error, which is what should be happening. Um, on the future pay amount, <clears throat> uh, what was happening before it, the, uh, it was charging more than the gross for specific accounts um, on the in the user interface. So when you were creating a, the future record that was happening. So um, if you use a fixed account and more uh, and charge more than the gross value, uh, it would throw an error. But if that error was corrected and the future pay record was saved and then edited, the day about charge um, is returned to the value greater than the gross. So basically you could have gone in and fixed it while maybe you had to go back into that record. When you did that, it reverted back to just how it was before. So it will no longer do that. And um, what will happen is it'll validate and run against um, that in all cases. So it will not allow you or allow the system um, to charge more than the gross for that particular record. So that was corrected. On the pay report, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the current and or future totals for gross calculations uh, was not correct when there was a deferred doc present in the payroll. So what we did is we actually went out and um, fixed that. So if life insurance, the uh, non-cash taxable benefit or the deferred doc option are used uh, for current or future, the pay will no longer, uh, the pay report will no longer include those totals in that total for gross calculations. So that has been taken care of. So the districts won't have to worry about that so much anymore. Um, another fix was the personal leave to pay. There were some rounding problems when that process was being ran. And so we fixed the rounding errors that were occurring. And then the last fix on this release was um, to, to fix this uh, the compensation records from being orphaned. And how that was happening is when a new contract record is created, a compensation is automatically created like in the background. Um, and what happened is if a district went in, okay, they created the new contract. Well, they said, oh, no, no, we, I, I don't like that when we got deleted, I got to start over. So they deleted that record. Well, what was happening before is that compensation record that was created once that, when that new contract was created was orphaned, basically meaning it was still sitting out there because you only deleted the new contract. Well, now we have fixed that. So if you go in and create a new contract, delete it, it deletes both the new contract record as well as the compensation record that it creates. We had some improvements on the 669 release. Um, one of them being, uh, we updated the SSDT user listing report to include enable and lock properties. We, uh, a district had asked for that. And I'll just show you that report. These two fields right here are now added to the report. So you can see those on there. Uh, the future pay mass at mass load um, mass amount load, I should say. <clears throat> you can obviously, when you're using mass load to feed your pay, you can load specific pay accounts to be included when you do that, you know, when you're doing the mass load. Um, obviously, it has to include the X refer, the account code on the, on the CSV file. But any of the four fields that I'm going to tell you about also need to be provided on the load file in order for it to work. If they don't, you're gonna get an error. And those four fields are the rate type, amount charged, the leave projection, and employer distribution fields. Those also have to be on that CSE file in order for those pay accounts to get loaded. Uh, new contracts, uh, the mass copy contracts, we added a field called um, include archived employees or include archived compensations. 
So let me just go into that and show you that really quickly. Maybe. Oh my goodness, there we go. So the mass copy compensations, and then up here you will see include archived employees, include archived compensation. So the district has the capability of going in and choosing it if they want to. Um, another thing that we fix, and we had this had been requested by a few districts. Um, on the uh, payables check listing, before when you process the payables report or you when you process your payables, the only thing you got on your report was just a total list of everything that was paid. Well, if you have a payee that has more than one payable that gets paid to it, normally in classic, it always used to like give you the pay, but then it broke it down underneath. And we fixed that, so it will do that now. So let me go in here and show you really quickly what the report looks like now. I'll just go ahead and process all of these. Maybe. And if this doesn't work, I have a I had a payee set up that had multiple uh, items or multiple payroll items. And so hopefully it'll work correctly and you should be able to see what I'm talking about here. Go ahead and pull this up. Here it is. Yeah. Okay. So right here, this is what I'm referring to. So here's your payee, but then here are all of the different, um, basically payroll items that get paid to that payee. So you can see it, it gives you the code as well as the, as the name and as, um, the information as far as how much was paid. So this is a really nice improvement. And a lot of, uh, there were several people that had asked for that. Okay. Lori? Yes. I'm um, sorry. Does this run when they, so when they post the, the payables, this report runs? Correct. In Correct. Yes. When you run just the payables reports, it does not. But when you actually post to actually pay the payables, then this report is created. You'll see there's two different things that were created. One is called the checks XML, which was you know, it's going to be for your printing of your checks, but then this payables payment report also is created. And that's what's going to have all this information on it. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the next uh, thing that we did, let me go back here, is um, the USPS uh, underscore standard underscore AOS permission it was added to the district audit job and the SAC one audit job. Um, that is a required uh, rule to be scheduled for the jobs. And I know we've been we've had a lot of uh, questions on this, but I believe that permission was granted to the general manager and the USPS standard rule already. Um, we have uh, some work to do. There's an, one more position or one more permission that needs to be like automatically included in those in those roles, and we're going to be working on that. But that that AO, the USPS standard AOS uh, permission is one of them that that we did add. But now we have one other we have to get added, and we will be doing that. So you know the US ITCs or the districts don't have to go out and add that separate permission to you know, an employee that has USPS standard uh, role. So we'll get, we're going to get that fixed. And the other thing that we fixed, um, we updated the audit jobs creation. Uh, what, what happens is when we did that audits job out and when you, when that is set up out in the job scheduler, that report should have been, and it is, set to run annually. So like every year that report should be running. Well, we had a uh, 
a program that basically goes out and cleans up those, the report after it processes while they forgot, hey, we don't want to clean that one up. We don't want to get rid of that because we want that to run every year. So we have actually gone in and made a correction to that. Uh, it was a temp variable. And so they actually went in and corrected that. So now that will not happen any longer. That report will always be out there. So every year it will process annually, annually. whenever the, the, Chrome, the Chrome job set is set up for it, for it to run, it will process at that time. Okay, any questions on the 669? All right, we'll go to the 670 release. Um, we did have some bug fixes here. Uh, we changed how the attendance validation works for positions with different retirement systems. So before um, you have an employee that had SERS and SCRS positions, they had two different kinds, two different jobs. Well, they wanted to go out and add attendance for the same day, but for the two different positions. Well, when they did that, they had to enter in, you know, 0.5 for the SCRS and 0.5 for the STRS position. They no longer have to do that. We have fixed it now. So you could actually go in and put in one for the uh, SCRS position, one for the STRS position. And so I'll go in here really quickly and show you. And I, like I said, this is for attendance. So if I went in and did a create, and I know this employee, he has, he has a teaching position and he also has a cook position. So I'll just go in and choose a date here. Attendance. I'll copy this and pull him up. And we'll do this position five, eight, three. And his attendance. So you can see the same. And you'll see that I have the length of one. If I go ahead and click save, it should save both records without error. And it did. Before that wasn't happening, it was airing because you cannot have more than one, you know, one day, one entry for the day. Now you can since it's two, two different retirement codes. So that has been fixed. Um, on the pay report, made a correction there. Go back here. What was happening is um, the total participants and the payroll item totals was being inflated. And the reason that was happening is if you have an employee, let's say you have an employee that has a oh, three city record. Well, he has two jobs. He has one job and he pays a certain percentage. Well, then job two, he pays another percentage. Well, what was happening is on the pay report, it was inflating the employee count because of those two records. Same employee, but it was inflating it by one. So we have corrected that and it will no longer inflate that number. Um, another fix, the SCRS advance archive mid-year contract change caused the original compensation not to be used on the advance report. So that was during the advance, we found this, it was a problem. So what was happening is if a mid-year contract change was done on a compensation that would norm, that is normally in advance, and then the mid-year change is archived, the original compensation stop date was set back to the original stop date. And then the advanced position report was not using that original compensation. And then the uh, fiscal year report would not calculate the advance amount using the initial figure from that original record. Um, so we corrected that and uh, next, next year, next fiscal year for the advance, that would be noted. You should notice that that was, is now working correctly. And then the last bug fix that we had was um, when a district was running reports, uh, the date code extract interface. So basically if they had gone out and created, um, you know, a, uh, a run of for the report, they created a template or whatever they wanted to use. It was always reverting back to the default report, no matter what. So like they went and created it, created it and used it once. Well, then when they would go back into it again, they were still on the screen, it would revert back to that default. So we have fixed that. So it does not override 
um, what the most the most recent run of the report like it was doing in the past. Um, we had some improvements. Uh, what, uh, one of them was always set the job calendar reference in the in the compensation, and so all compensations basically have their own job calendar property being set uh, directly, and so that means that the filtering and sorting on the compensation should work for all compensation that have a position that has a job calendar. So if there's a job calendar associated with the position, you should be able to go into compensation and sort. So if you filtered on the grid, um, on the compensation grid, and you pull up the compensation, the job calendar, and the type, those three are selected on the grid, it should allow you to filter now on it. Before it was not doing that. <coughs> so they've corrected that. <clears throat> um, something else that we did is um, we're not, you can now include um, employees being paid from accrued wages on the CSV extract for the afford report. So this was a little confusing. I know some people had questions on it. Um, I'll go out to the afford report because we did add, to pull up here. We added this here, include employees with no retire hours on the CSV file. So if that's the case, okay, if the district leaves that unchecked, they said basically saying no, they don't want to include them. Um, it will not include zero retire hours on the CSV file or the PDF file because you're saying, I don't want to include them. I don't want them to be on here. Now, if they go in and check this box, what's going to happen is it's going to include the zero retire hours employee on um, only the CSV file. They will not be on the PDF, but only on the CSV file. And I'm pretty sure that's how it worked in Classic as well. So basically, they will be included, but only on the CSV file, not on the PDF file. <clears throat> And then one other thing that we did as far as an improvement, and this will be, this is really nice because when you go into a 400 or a 450 record, basically I should say 400 right now, 450 is on its way, it's being fixed. But the 400 record right now, let's just say that you're changing an employee to be a rehired retiree. Okay, the district went in and they checked the, let me go back, let me, do a visual here so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, let's pull the 400 record. All right, so if I went in here and let's just say that I'm gonna change this employee to be a rehired retiree. I marked the box, but I didn't mark the rehired date. I'm gonna go ahead and click save. I get it now get an error because it's requiring me to put in a rehired date. And the same holds true if I went in here and put in a rehire date and don't have a rehire, rehire retiree that, that box checked, I would get a validation for that as well. So that is really nice because that has been missed a lot by districts. You know, they'll just go in and check the box and forget to put in the rehire date. Now they're forced to, they have to because it is an actual error the validation is an error and they have to get that corrected before it'll, they can actually save that record. All right, any questions on the 670 release notes? All right, we'll move right along here. We had just a couple things that we fixed, had a hot fix for on the 670.1 release. And one of them was on that afford report, uh, remove employees who have not uh, been paid if the user entered date range uh, in, the, in those date range parameters. So basically, if you ran the afford report and you know you had 7-1 through 7-15 on there, well, John Smith well, hasn't been paid since last year, he was still being included on the report. That's not gonna happen anymore. Only employees who have been paid within those dates of the of what you're running the, the, the report for are going to get included on the report. And then obviously, like I said earlier, 
we had to revert the change that we made on the 669 release uh, for the EMIS employee reporting because it was causing some issues. So we basically backed that out uh, to get the correction for EMIS reporting. All right, and then the final release was the 671 release. And we did have um, some bug fixes, just a few. Uh, one of them was the uh, earnings register is no longer going to require payroll item configuration permissions. We corrected that. Um, all that they need is the USPS standard payroll view permission to run the employee earnings register. So that should uh, help you know, some of the districts with that problem. Um, another bug fix was the EMIS reporting is no longer going, going to be looking at the archive compensations when attempting to find hours and day property. Before it was looking at the archive records as well as the current files when looking for the hours per day. It's no longer going to be looking at archive records. And the last uh, bug fix was the contract obligation validations uh, will now include dock amounts going forward. Um, there was an issue with the calculations went because we were not including the dock amount. I mean, in reality, the dock amount is part of the contract. And so we were not including those before. That has been corrected. So now we're going, uh, those will be, include, uh, be included in the calculations as well. And then we did have a couple of improvements. Uh, we improved the performance of the payroll modify, uh, anywhere from 58 to 76 percent improvement. You know, depending on what what you're doing, who, how much you're improving or modifying. It basically we got about 58 to 76 percent improvement. And then we also for the uh, benefit accrual reports go out to those. We added the CSV option, output option to all of the reports now. So you can see the accrual. Um, we have go here, the CSV option as well as Excel data. Same thing for the reset personal, the convert personal to pay, convert personal to sick, and even the part-time sick leave accrual. All of those now have the CSV option as well as the Excel data option when running those reports. Uh, someone said, thank you for fixing the contract obligation to include DAC amounts. You are welcome. <laughs> I'll pass it on to the developers. There's, they're the ones that did it. Um, and then the last thing that we had, we did have a new feature added. Um, the new feature basically is going to allow um, the applicable growth to include uh, life insurance, uh, non-cash payments, uh, NC1, NC2, and NC3 amounts for state other, it should be other state tax items because before they didn't have an option to be able to choose that. Well, now if you go to the payroll item configuration, let's just say that you're creating or maybe you already have one set up for another state. I'll just go in and create one. So I'm gonna go down to say tax, I can hit create here. You'll see this non-cash tax benefit box is there now and it's already defaulted, it's checked. And you it, pretty much we've got all you know the other annuity options, but we did now include this non-cash non tax benefit. The non-cash taxable benefit. There we go, got the right wording. So that's now out there for any other states that districts may have within their system. Okay, does anyone have any questions on that 671 release? Okay, um, let's take about a five minute break. We'll get set up for the USAS side of things. And thanks everybody for tuning into the payroll side. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started with the USAS. In the month of July, we had three um, releases, and one of them included a bug that 
um, the user was able to change the void date on a disbursement that was not actually voided. So let me show you that. We still have um, the documentation with the old screen. So before the user on a disbursement saw both these buttons. And now when you go in and you look at just the outstanding disbursement, you only see void. And if you look at a void, you'll get that option to change the void date. So it's no longer together and we'll update that documentation, but it was perfect for training. Um, another thing that we did was improve the receipt code. Um, this was actually part of the AOS um, accounts. However, it was in the appendix of the manual, of the 2013 manual. So now it is added to the list of the redesign receipt codes. So if you go to create one, it will um, populate for the community school um, sponsor sponsorship fees. And it was 1831. And now it's in the system, so it'll populate. Um, like Lori mentioned about the audit jobs, it, the developers removed the variable that uh, allowed the audit jobs. It was included in this cleanup job and it wiped out all the audit jobs that the district scheduled. However, you can see it's been fixed because now the next run is tomorrow and the last run was earlier today. So it's no longer wiping those out. We also updated the federal assistant detail report that goes into the file archive at the end of the fiscal year. So under the fiscal year reports archive, this report is only including the current fiscal year's data. Oh, I'm sorry. So only the expenditures within fiscal year 2022, for example, before it was including everything that was on the screen for the federal detail assistant. And then we had some cosmetic changes to the 1099s. Now keep in mind, these are continually being updated so that the users can print their own 1099s. So part of this improvement was reorganizing these buttons at the bottom because generally the process is to print the report prior to generating the submission file. So we swap those two buttons around. And I noted on the recap that there is another JIRA issue that's going to re rename this button back to generate. And this is because it this button doesn't just create a submission file but it also creates like the PDF format and other, it generates other things. So we're gonna, the developers on that JIRA issue, USAS R5027 is gonna change that button, but not the functionality. And then some improvements with the, uh, like performance improvements, included the pending transaction to the purchase order. And depending on how big in the accounts, it improved 28 to 52%. The PO to the AP invoice process increased um, in performance by anywhere from 38 to 64%. The payable to disbursement process increased 18 to 35% in the pending transaction to the disbursements increased by 11%. Um, you probably read the email uh, regarding this bug that was in, introduced with these performance um, improvements. 
there will be a hot fix. The bug was um, in regards to the purchase order date on the XML file. Uh, it was using the wrong, it was using the created date rather than the date that was entered by the user. So that will go out on the hot fix soon. And I believe the email instructed how to update those purchase order dates um, until that fix is released. And if you have any questions, just let us know. And then lastly, we just had four specific patches um, to specific districts for either removing that void date, which was the, the bug up here that corrected and removed that button. So we corrected that district's data as well as um, a purchase order charge amount and um, another bug that was just affected one district in regards to an account change and um, account histories. And that is all I have for you, SAS. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, then Michelle will go over the um, inventory releases during the month of July. Thank you. I'll go ahead and just switch my screen over quickly. Okay. Um, so we had uh, two regular uh, releases and one hot fix for the month of July. And so it was versions 119 and 120 were the regular. <clears throat> and then at the end of July, we had a 121 hot fix. And so um, um, the bug fixes that um, we were able to um, accomplish here in July, uh, dispositions. Um, we fixed a bug that prevented the filtering of items uh, when creating a disposition. So what was happening is, I'll go in there. When going in and creating an item, a disposition, um, they weren't able to go in and start entering the tag number they wanted to dispose of. It wasn't filtering correctly. So we have um, we fixed that then on that release um, in July in order for you to start typing in an asset, an item, and then it will filter that. So, um, so yeah, so it should be able to pull up now any active items. Um, that way then you can pull that one in and pull the disposition transaction against it. Uh, the next bug was fiscal today depreciation calculations. We're not handling a negative depreciation. Um, so that was showing up on some of the uh, reports and stuff like that on the fiscal today calculation. So that was fixed as well to handle those negative depreciation amounts. Um, for the migration import, um, there were uh, items that um, the, were getting a warning about invalid uh, line length. And so we corrected that in order to make that a bit more user friendly. So it shows that the import size is too short is what the new message will be. And I believe that had to do with, um, yes, with importing files where there were wrapping issues. Um, so we enhanced that import log message to be a bit more user-friendly on those. Um, you know, obviously the documentation um, will be updated to reflect that. I haven't had a chance to update the common import errors um, documentation to reflect that, but that will get updated. Um, items, in the items record, um, updating the item type number to always be uppercase. Uh, we ran into an issue where um, users were able to create an item called book, all caps, and then create an item with lowercase book. Um, so we have prevented that now that in creating an item, the um, tag number will always be in uppercase. Uh, the configuration, uh, when closing the fiscal year, that last post fiscal year field wasn't getting updated properly. So we fixed that in the configuration screen. In items, we corrected the bug um, so that now once a new item has been added and the user goes into that item, they just posted it, 
and they go in to edit it, they're still in that window, um, they were getting some type of acquisition error. It was an odd error. It wasn't reflecting the tag number or anything. Um, so we corrected that. So if you know they go in and post an item and they notice right there in the item window that the location is wrong, they can quit going, click on edit, and it should allow them to go in then and make changes. Updates uh, were made to the fixed asset by source report. Uh, we were having some adding issues with the items that had an acquisition method of donation. Um, those amounts were not getting included in the report, thus causing balancing issues when they were trying to compare the fixed asset by source report to the classic 101. So those, those have been fixed and they're now being included. Also acquisitions that do not have an account code the amounts for those were not being included in the fixed asset by source report. So we fixed that as well. Um, the summary version of the schedule of change to fixed assets report, um, we had, a, I think, one or two tickets where they're trying to run it and they were just getting like dumped out of the report with some type of error message. Um, so the report wouldn't even generate. And that was from something that we fixed on the 118 release that resurfaced. Um, so we fixed that again. So um, being able to run a summary, schedule of change by fixed assets shouldn't be an issue. It was kind of a unique situation. So it didn't happen very often. And uh, the hot fix uh, that we got out last week was in regards to uh, the importer, when you were doing migrations, it wasn't calculating the fis fiscal to date depreciation. That fiscal to date depreciation gets calculated on the fly. It's not stored anywhere like the life to date is. Like you can see the life to date on an item, you can't see a fiscal to date unless you're going in and running reports and balancing and noticing wait a minute, my 305 fiscal to date amounts do not match my 305 fiscal to date amounts on the classic report. So, um, so we found the issue, there were a couple things going on. Uh, one was in regards to causing negative fiscal to de depreciation amounts for items that were already fiscal, were already fully depreciated. Um, you could have seen a bunch of just like negative amounts <clears throat> on that fiscal to date column. And so <clears throat> we fixed that and also we noticed that fiscal to date amounts were getting overinflated. So your redesigned fiscal date total could be $2 million off from the classic one. So we knew obviously there's an issue. So um, that was all based off of the 120. If you migrated their data um, using the 120 release, it was causing these issues. So obviously if you migrated before, uh, the 120 you weren't having those issues. So when we uh, posted the release notes last week, we did put in there that if you perform the migration using the 120 release, you will need to re-import the classic data. Obviously, you would have found it. When you did the balancing, you know, you would have said, wait a minute, these totals are way off. So those of you that you know, knew that, um, you know, and noticed it on the balancing, you know, the only way to correct this is to re-import their data. And then their 305 amount should be up. So those were some of the bug fixes that we had. Um, another, uh, some improvements that we made um, this uh, last uh, month of July is in items, um, changing the life to date depreciation field to be only read only. So let me talk about that. Those out of here, and go to items, because there are some changes. They haven't been documented yet. So on my to-do list. Um, so I'm just gonna put on a tag here. And I'm just going to go in and view it. And so you're gonna see a couple little uh, differences here. And it's in regards to the depreciation information. And we just released the 121 release uh, last night. So that should have gone out on Friday, but we had still a uh, few more things that we needed to work on. Um, so some of these changes kind of spilled over into the 121 release. But what you'll notice down in the depreciation, um, we restricted in July um, the ability to just go in and modify the life-to-date depreciation. 
there, you know, we were afraid we were going to be running into issues when it came to, you know, new, being in new years and making changes. And if you reopen a prior year and, you know, close it and, re, and then go back in the new year, the life to date depreciation figures weren't getting, you're we afraid that we're, they weren't going to get handled properly. So, what we've decided to do is create a depreciation transaction kind of adjustments area. And that's this area right here, depreciation transactions. And you'll have to forgive my test files because we've been testing future years and stuff like that. So kind of ignore the future years. I think we're in fiscal year 22 in these files. Um, but what we did is we removed the ability to go in and modify the life to date. And instead, you have to create depreciation adjustments now. And so that will help so that when, you know, they do need to make a change to the life to date depreciation, it's showing here. And also the system will be better able to handle it when they go and close and reopen and close a year again. So that's why we had to put this in here. Um, and so you'll notice here that um, you'll see that when they were testing, they were going in and making depreciation adjustments. So this is similar to like budget adjustments. Um, so basically when I click on create, it's gonna go in and I must be in 22 because it took me to 22. So that's my current year. Um, and it's going to go in then and I can put in a description. I put in the amount and it will take positive or negative. And then I click on save. And when I do that, it will adjust my life to date depreciation figure. Um, so that's basically what that is doing. And what I like too is it's giving me a history of what has happened um, regarding the life to date. And I think the auditors will uh, appreciate that as well. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now with the depreciation transactions. Um, but like I said, I haven't documented this yet, but I will get this out there. Um, so that everyone is aware that we've made, you know, a change to that. Um, another thing is uh, we went in and um, we had some like restrictions that really didn't need to be um, on the actual item. So I'm going to go back in to that particular item here and um, underneath the depreciation information, um, we were um, requiring a life expectancy, even when there was an education method, and that doesn't make sense. So if they don't, aren't tracking depreciation, you really don't need a life expectancy. So we fixed that so that it no longer requires a life expectancy anymore. And also um, the beginning depreciation date will only be required if there is a depreciation method. We had to fix that because again, I didn't have a method and I put in and I didn't um, it was requiring me to put in the beginning date, and I don't need to because I'm not tracking. So we made sure that um, they have to have a valid depreciation method. When they do, then the beginning date is required. And that's basically how it works in Classic. Um, let's see. For another thing in items is when the capitalization will be calculated when updating an existing item. Um, so what we were experiencing, I kind of think this is more of a, a bug per se than an improvement. Um, you have an item right now that isn't capitalized. And you go in and add an additional acquisition to it that now makes it capitalized. Um, it wasn't showing on the item that it was marked as capitalized. So we fixed that now. So if, you know, you're going in and you have you know, created an acquisition that was for a negative amount, uh, thus making it no longer capitalized. Um, again, the flag's been fixed that it will mark that so that it's no longer capitalized either. So it works both ways. Whether you add an item that makes it capitalized or whether you add a negative acquisition item that no longer makes it capitalized, it should adjust and update that capitalization flag on a minute. And let's see, one other thing I wanted to show you is the last one here in core fiscal year. So I'm gonna go down here because this um, has um, not really changed, but it's, it's working better. 
um, we were running into problems where people were closing a fiscal year um, or they opened a new fiscal year and didn't close the old year. And they made the, you know, the new year open and current um, or they just made it current and they couldn't go back to the prior year. So they were kind of stuck. So if I was, you know, I had fiscal year 22 um, open and also fiscal year 23 open and I went in the 23 current, I couldn't go back and, and switch in the 22 current then. So we fixed that. So now that you're able to go in and maneuver around and make, you know, whatever open years, also current years. Um, so that's been fixed. Um, and uh, we have a note there too in the notes that if you're going in and making, you know, reopening a period and you add another item to that period that the depreciation values are going to be updated to reflect that. Um, we don't have the reports yet, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but at least you're able to go in, make those changes, and it will update depreciation accordingly. So, and that also, I believe, will get reflected in the item underneath that new depreciation. It will probably show some type of internal adjustment that was made in order to adjust the depreciation figure. So those were the big... Um, changes that we made in uh, inventory here in July. Um, I do want to take you to just, I know that some of you are really, you know, wanting districts are, are wanting to start to close inventory here if they haven't already soon. And I know that, um, you know, you guys have questions regarding some of these fiscal year end uh, related JIRA issues and where we're at with those. So, um, on the 121 release that just went out, uh, the one related fiscal year and report that we put on there is um, creating fiscal year and balances reports. That's the equivalent of the EIS close report. The classic EIS close created two reports. It created an EIS close.txt and an EIS depreciation, EIS DEP.txt report. And so we got the one report ready. EIS close. Um, so that's out there. And they can run that report ahead of time. The classic, it ran when you ran EIS close. Well, obviously, you close now by going into fiscal years and closing your, your reporting period. Um, so if they want to see what their ending balances are um, on a report, they can run this before they close. Um, so that's what that report is about. That's the, I believe, only fiscal year end related thing on the 121. Um, and like I said, the 121 is about a week behind. So our next scheduled release, and I'm going to go to our JIRA issues here, is 122. And that is scheduled to go out next Friday, um, the 12th. And um, we will have EIS CD equivalent on there. Yay! So that will be out there um, for districts to run. Um, and obviously we'll get, I'll try to get that documentation updated right away so that that's in there so that they can view that information. Um, and on the, and I know that's a big one. So I think that's the only major fiscal year related um, issue that we have for the next release. And then on the next one, 123, which is scheduled to be released here at the end of August, I believe, um, that will be, yes, that'll be August 23rd. Um, so the 123 will be August 23rd. And these are the um, fiscal year end related, all of them are regarding fiscal year end. Um, and so we will have the EIS close depreciation report available on that release. So EIS closes EIS DEP report will be available on that one. And also 332 here and 315 kind of go hand in hand. I know a lot of you have been asking when could we mass load um, items for like a new district that didn't migrate and you know mass load all of their assets regardless of the fiscal year. Well that's scheduled for the 123. So the 332 is the gap, um, the EIS gap equivalent. So for those new districts that are using gap, 
um, their gap balances need to be set before you start mass loading all of these assets from many fiscal years. Um, so that needs to be out there and in place so that when you do go then and upload a spreadsheet of all of their assets, um, it will record those beginning balances properly. So again, this is for districts that are, you know, have their gap flag set um, and what to use gap in inventory. So, um, so the 332 will take care of the EIS gap. And then the 315 is what you're going to use to go into the system import option and mass um, import those assets. So again, those are both scheduled for the end of August. So hopefully by the time September rolls around here, we'll have all the fiscal year end and some of these major enhancements um, available for uh, the districts to use. So any questions? Okay, well, I think that uh, covers it for the July recap and just a little extra on what's going on here in the future for inventory. And if you guys don't have any other questions, have a great weekend and we'll talk to you guys soon.